Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Shree Memorial Library Author Chat. Tonight we have author, well, actually we do the author chat every uh, first Thursday night of the month. Uh, right here on Zoom at 6 p.m. Tonight, we're going to welcome author uh, Libby Copeland. Libby is a New York, uh, well, actually, Libby, Libby writes from New York. Uh, she's written for the New York Times and several other publications. We're going to jump right in because she's got a lot of interesting information for us. Of course, the name of her, of her book is The Lost Family, and uh, she's going to get started. Um, Everybody, let's welcome Libby Copeland. Hi there, it's so nice to be with you and I'm happy to meet you, Ivy, thank you. Yes, um, Libby, um, of course your book is called The Lost Family and um, it's all about DNA and before you swipe, what is your advice? Yeah, so um, you know, one of the most important things to think about when you are um, considering taking a DNA test is that um, it's sort of um, marketed as entertainment. Um, the industry is known as recreational DNA testing, um, but it's important to know that um, you can find out things that can be really profound um, and sort of change the way you think about your family and yourself. Um, and so that's um, something to, to think about um, when you're considering testing. Um, what I was particularly interested in when I was reporting my book were um, this not insignificant minority of people who find out, for instance, that they're not related to their dad, the man they consider dad when, they're, when they do a test, um, or who discover um, other things like that they have a, a half sibling they didn't know about, or that something about their family history isn't what they always believed. Um, and that leaves people kind of grappling with, um, really important um, under new understandings of themselves that can have repercussions that stretch on and on for years um, and potentially allow them to make connections with new genetic kin. And sometimes the genetic kin on the other side wants to have those relationships and sometimes they don't. Um, and I really wanted to kind of um, in the lost family kind of document how those different situations go and why they go well when they do and, and, and the reverse. Um, so what should you think about? Um, you should think about that sometimes there are secrets in every family um, and sometimes the DNA test is gonna be the means by which you find out. Um, and that increasingly um, there's so many people in the databases that it may not actually matter whether or not you choose to test um, because somebody else who shares your genetic material may test and um, genetic secrets are coming out in families um, and um, it's just not a matter of, um, it's not a matter of if but when. How did you come to write this book? Uh, about three years ago, I was, so I've been a journalist for a little over 20 years. Um, and I've always been really interested in um, intimate stories, you know, stories of, of, of why we human beings sort of do what we do and, and how we answer those questions of, of essential questions of identity, right? How we define ourselves. Um, and so about three years ago, I was in conversation with one of my editors at the Washington Post, which is a newspaper where I used to work and I now freelance for. Um, and we were talking about DNA tests because, um, you know, again, this is a technology that is very popular this time of year. Um, it is marketed as something that you could buy for 99 bucks, but it might be on sale for 49 bucks. Um, and, you know, it, it's sort of um, positioned as something where you're going to, it's going to allow you to make an act of discovery, but that act of discovery is often framed as something that's going to come with a certain amount of historical and emotional remove. Um, and so I was interested in those cases when um, people are stumbling into kind of revelations and discoveries that are much more immediate. And I wrote this one story, this really um, compelling story of a woman named Alice who, um, who tested back in 2012 and, and, and made this astonishing discovery that took her two and a half years to fully understand. Um, and when the piece ran, it kind of went viral. Um, and as a result, I started getting emails from people all over the country um, and, and actually abroad as well, hundreds of them. Um, from people who were telling me, you know, I've done DNA testing and I wanna tell you how it changed me. That was a good story, but now let me share mine. And there were so many um, demographics represented. There were so many people, um, young and old from like all over the US and, and again, outside the country as well. 
that I just thought, wow, this is like a, an astonishing phenomenon. This is actually amounting to a kind of a seismic shift in our culture and in, um, and in the American family. And I, I knew I had enough material that I wanted to make it into a book. Wow. Um, tell us a little bit about the story of Alice. Yeah, without so, giving... yeah, without giving it away, because Alice's story is is pretty epic. Um, so Alice, you know, I, I was able to tell her story kind of at newspaper length in 2017, but you know, newspaper length, even when they're being really generous with the pages, um, is not that long. Um, and so, you know, it, her story had a lot of twists and turns. And and what I did for the book was I was able to turn it into the central narrative um, because it's so compelling because I could also go back and do historical research and really like expand her story. Um, so Alice tests back in 2012, um, this, the DNA testing industry has been around for 20 years, but 2012, eight years ago, really marks an inflection point um, because it is the moment when a new type of DNA testing is coming on the scene. Um, and this type of DNA testing, um, is called autosomal and what it can do and what makes it different from what had been before is it can give you two bits of information. It can give you your relatives, your immediate relatives on both sides, your maternal and your paternal relatives. Um, and it can give you that ethnicity estimate, that pie chart that you see in the ads that everyone wants, right? And that's gonna tell you um, an estimate that's not always perfect of where your various people came from 500 to a thousand years ago. And so 2012 um, is when Ancestry basically comes on the scene and Ancestry would eventually become the biggest player in the space. And um, Alice was a genealogist, so she was already subscribing to Ancestry's um, our genealogical archives. And she gets an email that tells her they're gonna start an, up a new DNA test. And would she like to take it? Would she like to get on their list and be one of their first testers? And she says, yes. Um, at the time she's in her sixties, she's a, um, really cool um, technology maven who has spent her career working with technology and kind of like improving technology and working with um, databases and information flow. And she's one of these people who can take a lot of information and kind of corral it and make it make sense. Um, and so it's not like at all intimidating to her and her scientific bent of mind to think of like testing her DNA. But she knows what she's gonna get going in as everyone thinks they do. And what she believes she was going to get is results that are pretty much all one, one color from one place, which is the, the British Isles and primarily Ireland, right? She knows her family's Irish on both sides. Um, she knows they go way back. Um, and so she's just looking to do what genealogists always want to do, which is break through some brick walls, find some relatives, figure out where exactly in Cork County or her father's people come from, etc. cetera. Uh, and what she finds is really surprising, her results are half unexpected. So half of her pie chart is this Irish British Isles mix that she's expecting. The other half says that she's Ashkenazi Jewish, which is a term she's never heard before. And it's a term for people, Jews from Central and Eastern Europe who um, married and you know, lived together quite apart from the rest of the European population and have, as a result, a very unique genetic signature that looks really different from someone who's Irish. You can really tell the difference on an autosomal DNA test. And Alice at first assumes that this is mistaken. Um, and she actually writes Ancestry a nasty note. She says, you guys don't know what you're doing. Your science isn't up to snuff yet. Um, but then she starts to investigate. And what's interesting about Alice's story is that the typical explanations for a DNA surprise don't apply for her. So um, in most situations, if you get a DNA surprise, and particularly if it's a pie chart that's half unexpected ethnicity, the explanation is gonna be what's known as an NPE. And that stands for non-paternity event or not parent expected. Um, and it's you know basically finding out that your dad is not genetically related to you and that there's some stranger out there who's contributed half of your genetic material. Um, and that's, I mean, that would be the obvious explanation for Alice, but when she investigates it, it turns out that's not the case. Um, it's also not the case that she's adopted, which is another theory that she explores. It's not the case that she's donor conceived. Um, and it's not the case that her family hid their genetic ancestry. So there are stories you hear about, for instance, um, Jewish people converting to Catholicism or, you know, 
to Christianity, uh, to you know, Protestantism, um, and then hiding or assimilating their way out of that identity, not passing on that knowledge. Um, there are stories of very light-skinned African Americans who, to escape rampant discrimination, um, you know, pass as white, and then that knowledge, either intentionally or unintentionally, um, isn't passed down, right? And so you have these people making these acts of kind of historical discovery when they test, and Alice investigates that. And it turns out not to be the explanation. So in fact, it does take her two and a half years to unravel the beginnings of her genetic mystery, which turn out to go back a century. Um, and as I said, one of the pleasures of reporting this book was getting to go back and do all that historical reporting into the circumstances that led to um, her getting her, her story so wrong. Um, but I'll just back up and say, the reason I like Alice's story, in addition to the fact that it has a lot of twists and turns and red herrings, um, it's a classical kind of um, existential whodunit, um, is because it allows me to tell other people's stories. So every at every point I can sort of stop and say, you know, here's what an NPE looks like for this person, for that person. Here's another story of an NPE from the father's point of view, from the child's point of view. What does it look like to find out that your donor conceived and that you have 22 siblings um, or 50 or a hundred, between a hundred and two hundred in some cases, um, and because there are no regulations on the number of um, children that one donor can conceive. Um, what's it like to be 51 years old and find out through spitting into tube that you were adopted and nobody told you, you know, um, and trying to follow these stories in a really deep way, not in a sensational way, but to get into the interiority of these people's lives to understand the impact of that. And then the, really the beginning, that's the beginning of the journey, because then what do they do with that? It changes their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, read to us that part of uh, the story where um, the person finds out they're of another ethnicity and um, there are some surprises there. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of um, give you a bit of like context for this. So one of the stories I tell in the book is a story um, of hidden genetic ancestry. And it's the story of a man who is named Rosario Castro Novo. Now, Rosario doesn't start out with that name. Um, he starts out with a completely different name and he legally changes his name um, in young adulthood in a nod to what he understands to be his deep Sicilian heritage along his mother's side. His mother told him that they were Sicilian um, and he really clung to that Italian identity. So much so that as an adult, he converted to Catholicism. He learned to sing opera. Um, he flew his Italian American girlfriend to Italy to propose for her proposed to her. So he was fully like invested in this identity, but he was also a genealogist and he started to do genealogical research and he started to do DNA testing. And what those two things revealed was that he was not at all Italian. Um, in fact, what he was was 18% Sub-Saharan African. Um, and it turned out that his mother, when he went to her um, with this information and said, explain this, um, what's going on? She said, you know, she said, let me tell you a story about my life. Um, and she had grown up as a biracial child in a white rural area of Vermont. Her parents were not married. They had two children together, but they were not married. Um, and her, um, her mother was actually married to some, her mother was white and was married to a white man. Her, um, her father was black. Um, and they had this relationship, this lengthy relationship. Um, and at the time in Vermont, there were actually adultery, anti-adultery laws and her grandfather, but notably not her grandmother was put in jail for this relationship. Um, and so she was taken in by a foster family and the, the racial slurs that were directed at her and the sense of otherness that she experienced growing up in the middle of the 20th century were so profound that she was like, my son's not gonna experience any of this. I'm gonna tell him he's Sicilian. Um, and so with Rosario, you know, I talked to him many times over the course of his kind of um, discovery and then his, um, his reckoning um, to help uh, try to understand like the process that he was going through, right? How does somebody, he's wrestling with all these questions having to do with, with, with things I think that are essential human questions we all think about whether or not we ever take a DNA test, which is like, what is identity? What is ethnicity? Is it what you grow up with? Is it what your genes tell you you, tell you, you are? Um, and, and, and how is it that the nature of what you don't know, the reasons behind what you don't know might change how you decide to claim or not claim that identity? So 
Um, all of that is a very long um, kind of setup for um, this very short reading that I will do um, for one of the last times when I talked to Rosario, when he was talking to me about, about how he tries to make sense of what to call himself and what to think about the country that brought him to this very strange place. Rosario struggles with how to think about himself and how to present himself to the world. He says, it's kind of weird for a guy who presents as white to say, I'm black. I'm still getting used to it. Could he even claim blackness, he wondered, without that lived experience and without any of the implications of what it means to be perceived as a black man in contemporary America? Quote, I'll never know what it's like to be pulled over by a police officer and fear for my life, he said. Can I call myself black and never have to experience it? It almost seems unfair or like I'm pandering. And yet, on the other hand, his mother's elderly cousin, who is more fair-skinned than he, and according to her DNA results, has less African ancestry than his mother, is quite clear in her identity as a Black woman. It's a social construct, Rosario told me. I raised myself as an Italian man. I immersed myself in Italian culture. What do I do now? We were talking on Independence Day, and Rosario told me the more history he learned about his Black family, about the lives of Black people in Vermont and in the rest of America, the more he wondered what he should be celebrating on this day and if he should be celebrating at all. I quote, I have learned more about African-American history in this country and the more granular you get, the more bitter you become, he said. I never got to know my people. And yet genetic genealogy had also given him an opportunity to know about what had been hidden, to wrestle with his mother's pain, with his grandparents' sacrifices, with the wrongs done to his family. DNA testing had given back to him and to his mother a little of what was stolen by the past. Wow, wow. With um, more than 35 million Americans having taken uh, the home DNA test, um, according to the book, uh, you believe that we've kind of reached our tipping point. Yeah. So, Mike, come in on that for us. Yeah, yeah. So it's 35 million people who've, who are in the databases. Um, not all of them are American, majority of them are American. Um, and that means that somewhere probably between seven and 8% of the US population is somewhere in the database. But mm -hmm. actually, actually in a sense, it's almost everyone, right? Because, um, because if we are related, if you and I are third cousins, for instance, we share overlapping genetic segments. And my decision to test has implications for you and your privacy, um, even if you never choose to test. And that's because um, through these uh, genetic genealogy techniques, which involve doing genealogy um, and, and kind of understanding how two people are related, uh, an individual can find someone they're looking for um, through, through mutual cousins. So for instance, I use this example sometimes if I had a brother who had like a child in, um, in high school, like helped conceive a baby in high school, like and his girlfriend didn't tell him, let's say. Um, and let's say in this, in this very hypothetical scenario, um, it's 30 years later and um, he has this, this little girl who's all grown up, he doesn't know about, and she decides she wants to find her bio dad because her mom doesn't want to tell her. Uh, and she tests and she winds up in a database and, and he's not there but I'm his sister and I'm there. So I'm identified there as her genetic aunt and she can easily just reach out to me um, to determine her father's identity, but she doesn't even need to. Um, she can just look me up because I have a prodigious digital trail and she can look and see who I am and who my brothers are if I have more than one or if I just have one and she can easily figure out that it's say one of two brothers if I have two of them. Um, write them both a letter because they're probably able to be found fairly easily um, and get back her response. So that doesn't seem maybe so dramatic, but now consider the possibility that I need not be the sister to this hypothetical man. I could be his first cousin. I could be his second cousin. I could be his third cousin. Now think about all the third cousins you may potentially have, or you surely do have, whose names you don't even know because they're strangers to you. And the fact that their decision to test means that you are potentially identifiable, right? If someone's looking for you, which could be a real blessing actually, or not depending on the circumstances, right? And, <laughs> right? and you don't know until you kind of open the box what it's going to be for you, right? right. So the tipping point means that um, you know, the era of family secrets is over. 
right? If there's a genetic secret in your family, it's not gonna stay a secret. If it hasn't been turned up already, um, it's a matter of, of time. Um, and it also means that if there is something important about your own genetic origins, it may be that you don't even need to test to find that out. Um, and that means that we all have to start having really important conversations about, um, you know, about the things that we were never told um, and, and how to kind of reconcile ourselves to those. Um, and potentially it means that, um, that the older generation, the secret keepers um, need to start um, talking to their children about the things they were never told even before they test. Wow. You write about the NPEs, sort of um, tell us all about the NPEs. Yeah, so NPE stands for non-paternity event or not parent expected. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's called MPE for misattributed parentage experience. There's a lot of acronyms. Um, there's a lot of terms. The fact that there's so many acronyms should tell you something. It's a common experience. Um, it's probably between one and two percent of the population that um, that is, you know, could ex you know is, is an MP is the product of an MPE. Um, and so, just as as a statistical um, kind of fact of those people who are testing, of those tens of million people who are in the who are testing in the database, you know, some certain percentage of them is going to discover that they're not genetically related to their dad. How are they gonna find this out? Well, let's say their dad's not even in the system, but you know, let's say a sibling's in the system. The sibling is revealed to be a half sibling because you only share, you know, instead of um, about 50% of your genetic material, you share 25. Um, or potentially there's uh, you know, an unknown first cousin who shows up, but you know all your first cousins. Um, and well, that turns out that that's a paternal first cousin, right? Um, so, and, and so there's the, that it gets revealed that way. And there are, there are other ways you might look at your ethnicity estimate and it's half on the next, you know, you've been told all your life that you're half Swedish um, and it, it's telling you you're half Greek. Um, and that is sort of some of the many ways that, that NPEs can be uncovered. Wow. Um... We know that home DNA testing uh, impacts um, communities, uh, some communities more than others. Um, tell us, uh, I guess, in your studies, who have they impacted more? Well, there's a couple of ways to, to sort of um, answer that question, because on the one hand, the people who are most in the databases are, are white European Americans. Right? Those are the people who are drawn to testing, um, those are the people who have historically been um, more populous in the in the in the um, databases going back to the early days of genetics, um, and and those are the people who are going to get the really granular results when they test because because other communities have historically been undersampled and that's a real problem and that means that um, if you test and you're from one of those communities that's undersampled your results are going to be more kind of vague right, some huge region, all of West Africa versus something much more specific, where somebody who's, um, you know, testing and they're, um, you know, from, from Western Europe is potentially gonna get really, really a great deal of precision. Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, DNA testing has also been, you know, a real boon to communities who have historically had more trouble with doing genealogy. And now why would you have difficulty doing genealogy? Because there aren't the records there. Because records tend to coalesce around power, right? Your community needs to be literate. Your community needs to be able to um, you know, have records that were preserved, have records first exist because you were important enough to warrant records with your names on them, right? And then those records have to continue to exist because they haven't been burned down, they haven't been affected by, um, by, by war, by migration, um, you know, by, um, by synagogues or churches being burnt down. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, um, and so one group that has historically been, you know, um, sort of underprivileged, if you will, by genealogical records is the African-American community. Because if you, for instance, try to research back before 1870 and your people were enslaved, they're no longer named before 1870. Because um, for the, in the federal census, at least, they were just regarded as tick marks in a box. They were, you know, they, their names were no longer, they were not recorded before that date. So how are you supposed to do research and trace your family back if, if the brick wall is 1870. 
Um, and so the way around that for some communities, it, including some African American genealogists is DNA testing. And I write in the book about the story of a man named T.L. Dixon. He has a great blog if you wanna check it out, it's called Roots and Recombinant DNA. And he specializes in African DNA, Native American DNA. Um, and you know he talks about how he used DNA and he was able to get real great precision along several branches of his family. And the kind of amazing one, the kind of like most amazing story was that he was able to find a present day um, cousin who lives in Africa. Um, and by hooking up with this cousin, he was able to trace back one branch of his family, not just to a region, not just to like a contemporary nation state within that region, but to like a specific community of people, the Fulani. And then he was able to sort of converse with his cousin and look up these people and see like, okay, what was the language they would have been speaking at this time? What were their traditional practices? You know, um, uh, how were they traveling? You know, how were they living? And that gave him access to knowledge about an ancestor from before this, you know, his ancestors were taken over in, um, in chains and, and essentially gave him access to knowledge about himself that it, it absolutely would not have had any other way. Wow. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. That it's a great story. And he amazing. tells a lot of it on his blog. It's, I really recommend his story. Uh, what happens when family history and family narratives collide? Oh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the central question at the heart of the book is, right, um, what happens when your truth and my truth, our sacred narratives, your understanding of your mother and my understanding <laughs> of our mother, um, only you didn't know I existed, right? It is, is sort of like clash. Um, there's a story in the book about a woman named Jackie. Um, Jackie was adopted as a child. She was a foundling. And a foundling is a term for somebody who is basically, you know, found. So she was placed in a basket on a pastor's doorstep um, at four days old. And, um, and her mom went down the block and called from a payphone. This was in the early 60s. Um, and someone in the pastor's house picked up and, you know, she said, there's a baby outside your front door. Um, and, and Jackie was, you know, taken in and then she was adopted um, by a family and she grew up um, feeling loved, but yet also feeling like she, the way she described it was just that she had a hole in her heart, right? She really, really wanted to understand who particularly her, her birth mother was and how, how it had come to be that her mom, her birth mother had given her up. This is, was really um, something that she wanted to understand from the time that she was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately after a number of twists and turns, she did manage to figure out the identity of both of her birth parents. And unfortunately, um, both sets of siblings essentially wanted nothing to do with her. Um, on her father's side, she has some siblings and they basically said, listen, our dad was like a really complicated guy. We don't always have the best memories of him. Um, and, you know, connecting with you is kind of a, a, a painful reminder of that, a man that we, you know, don't have, you know, didn't have such a great relationship with. So we're going to just pause on that. And they didn't welcome her in. Um, on her mother's side, uh, her maternal siblings basically said, we don't believe you, you know, and even though they were in the database showing up as half siblings to her, um, they said, we just don't think that the science bears out. We think that this is just a load of hooey. Um, and they said that because their narrative of their mother presumably was really threatened by this, right? And that's kind of what, that's kind of what's happening in many of these situations is, you know, does the fact of your existence invite me to question the limits of my mom's love, right? If she could do that, then I've got to revise my opinion of her. I, I've got to, um, I, I, I literally can't, I can't conceive that she could have done something like this, right? Or, or, uh, or, or it's troubling for a thousand reasons. Um, and Jackie in the act of kind of discovering herself and then introducing herself to her genetic kin essentially became the messenger of her own existence. Um, and there's this saying about the messenger, right? Don't shoot the messenger. If the messenger is bringing you bad news, right? Which is how people 
sometimes interpret this kind of thing, not with an open heart, but with a kind of a sense of a boundary violation. Um, if the messenger is bringing you bad news, you may very well kind of blame them for the message and say, who are you? What do you want? Are you really just trying to get some money, which is something that people often hear, unfortunately. Um, and what's so sort of sad about these situations is that, you know, the person who's coming in um, to this, to this um, kind of family hoping for a connection often feels really vulnerable and they're being rejected, right? And um, to be so vulnerable and to be rejected, it's very hard not to take that personally, even if you could say it's not personal, it's not about me, it sure feels real personal. Wow. Um, just for the sake of uh, the audience, can you tell us just how, um, how accurate is DNA testing? Yeah, so there's two basic buckets of information and those buckets are gonna vary in terms of how accurate they are. Um, so your, um, your DNA relatives, that those predictions of those relatives are, that's really, really solid science. You can really rely on that. Um, the relative predictions that you get are gonna, they're looking at overlapping genetic segments. They're gonna tell you how closely related you are to someone and, um, they can't always predict the precise nature of the relationship, but they can tell you like the degree of relatedness and then you may have to figure it out from there. But the ethnicity estimates are a little bit art, they're art and interpret the art of interpretation mixed with science. Um, you know, your DNA is really reliable, but DNA looks a lot like other DNA. So we are 99.5% identical in our DNA, you and me and everyone, right? Every human being. And so it's, it's a matter of interpreting what are, what are known as SNPs along the genetic code that could be one thing or could be on something else. And depending on the context, um, the, the algorithm that crunches the data is going to interpret it one way or another. And as they get more information and as they update their algorithms, their ethnicity estimates will improve. So that's why when you test with a company, um, you know, you'll get your 12% this and 40% that. And six months later, they'll roll out a new estimate. They'll say your results have been updated and they're changed a little bit right? Um, you're suddenly 14% instead of 12%. Um, and you're 35% 40% instead of 40% of something else. Um, sometimes there'll be something at the margins that simply shows up as a bit of noise and really isn't there. So for instance, for a while, um, one of the companies was telling me I was 1% Korean. Then in the next update that got downgraded to 0.1% South Asian. And then the next update, it disappeared altogether. So you have to be a little bit mindful and take that stuff with a grain of salt. Wow. Where do you see the industry going next? Uh, 23andMe um, and the other um, uh, companies out there that does DNA testing for ancestry. So, um, you know, if you look back at kind of the growth of the industry, it's been like a really steep climb. Like I wouldn't want to try to climb that hill. It's, it's extremely steep. Um, and then in the last year, it kind of slowed down. It's still growing, but, this, but, the, but the growth rate hasn't been quite as great as it was from say um, 2015 to 2019. Um, and so part of that, the thinking is that part of that may be some privacy concerns, but probably the bulk of it is that um, the people who are interested in DNA testing for ancestry purposes have tested, right? Um, and these companies may have kind of vacuumed up the early adopters who are willing to pay 99 bucks to do this. Um, and so uh, they've, they've begun to pivot towards health-related testing um, and sometimes partnering with physician networks to give you results about whether you are at higher risk of breast cancer, certain kinds of breast cancer, or maybe you um, need to, you know, want to know about whether you're at risk of early onset Alzheimer's or something um, along those lines. Um, and so that's part of what's happening as you're seeing a pivot toward health related testing, because those results are bundled with ancestry testing. Um, people are still going to be finding out stuff about their families, but they're also going to be finding out about their health. Um, and then trying to decide what to do with it. And that's kind of one of the central questions, right? Is when you do find out, uh, is it actionable information? Is it comprehensive enough? Do you really understand it? Those are some of the questions that, um, that come into play when you're doing health related testing. Wow. Um, do you have anything in your book that kind of uh, a passage that would lead into that? Oh, I'm talking about health related testing, you mean? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to think if I do. Um, I probably do. Let's see. 
Um, audience, if you have any questions, um, just uh, you can go ahead and put them in the comment box and we will try to get them answered as we go. You know, I have all sorts of stuff on health related testing, but it's probably not like bite sized and easy to read or easy to find at this point. So I won't hold you back um, kind of looking for that because um, it could be a while to find it in here. Um, wow. But I do, but I have like an entire chapter on it. <laughs> it's just a question of which part I would read. Um, yeah. yeah. But I could, you know, I have a section I could read if people are interested about um, non paternity events, because I think since that's one of the most common scenarios that people face, it's really one of the most important. Um, and I was really interested in this idea of like, when do these things turn out well, right? And how do people help that along, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I will, uh, I, I talk in the, I have a whole chapter, it's called non paternity events, and I tell a number of stories. Um, and some of them are more hopeful and some of them are less hopeful, but I like to tell the hopeful one because I think it points the way forward for a lot of families. Who decides what story we get to tell? Countless American men have by now been contacted and told that they helped make a child once and that those children would now like to introduce themselves. Some knew this day might come, others never imagined it. Many more will face this reckoning in years to come. And then there are men who find out that the children they raised are not their own. Quote, sometimes it's hard because she reminds me of what my ex did, one man told The Atlantic, referring to the girl he now knows is not his genetic daughter. The revelation led to his divorce. A genetic counselor named Brianne Kirkpatrick, who has started her own secret Facebook groups for people who've experienced DNA surprises, had a client who discovered at the age of 78 that neither of his children were genetically his. He was pissed, Kirkpatrick told me. He wondered if he could sue his ex-wife. But just as you can't anticipate what you'll discover when you test, you also can't predict how the other person on the other side of that test will react. I emailed with a man named Jeff Lester in Lebanon, Missouri, who told me that the discovery of a daughter he'd unknowingly conceived at the age of 16 was a miracle. She'd matched him on Ancestry DNA during a period when he had put his genealogical work on hold, so he never saw her messages there. Instead, she eventually messaged him on Facebook. Jeff told me he thought at first this was a scam. He was 50 years old and he did not remember getting any girlfriends pregnant back in high school. But he logged onto Ancestry and there she was, this girl, no, this woman, already 32 years old, already a mother herself, listed among his matches as his daughter. Jeff told me he could not get over the unlikeliness of his daughter finding him. Outside of DNA testing, it almost certainly would not have happened. She had been put up for adoption when she was a baby and did not know the identity of either of her biological parents. When Jeff helped her uncover her mother's identity, she turned out to be someone with whom he'd had a brief relationship he didn't remember consummating. It sounds like a bad after-school special, he told me. The other piece of the miracle, Jeff said, was that he was not supposed to be alive. He'd been diagnosed in his 20s with ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, and had been on a ventilator for two decades. With this sword of Damocles hanging over him, he'd built a life for himself, marrying and having three wonderful daughters. He was astonished that he'd not only outlived the odds, but lived long enough to discover that in fact, he had four daughters, plus a son-in-law and grandchildren. He felt the hand of God at work. He told me all this over email and Facebook messenger, typing by way of a wireless head controlled mouse attached to his glasses because the ALS severely limited his ability to speak. Jeff told me he was determined to live as fully as he could while he was still on this earth. He had forged a relationship with his oldest daughter and he and his wife even got to host the grandchildren for a sleepover. He did not feel guilty or ashamed about her existence. Those were wasteful emotions, he said, and his disease had taught him that none of us have time to waste. Under the shadow of imminent mortality, quote, you focus more on what is truly important in life, he wrote. For Jeff, the unexpected outcome of recreational DNA testing simply meant more love. I love that story. <laughs> Wow, that is amazing. Um, have you taken any DNA tests and uh, have you had any surprises or wasn't surprised? Yeah, no, I've, t I've tested. Um, I'm in three databases. Um, and you might say, why bother with testing in more than one place, right? Your DNA is your DNA. But of course, you're going to find different relatives. And I was very curious to compare the ethnicity estimates results. And, you know, they do vary. Um, so, you know, 
I, I will say we had as a family the kind of experience I think a lot of people hope to have, which is that it didn't kind of um, change any of what we knew, but it, it deepened it. Um, we were able to find relatives along both sides of my family, my mom's side and my dad's side and connect with cousins that, um, second cousins on both sides to both my parents um, that we wouldn't have known existed if it weren't for DNA. Um, on my mother's side, her people are um, Ashkenazi Jewish and, um, and her grandfather left behind siblings and branches of the family that he never spoke about and that we did not assume had survived, but in fact, they did. Um, and we were able to find a, um, a branch of the family that survived um, whatever the 20th century threw at Eastern European Jews in Ukraine, um, which would have included presumably pogroms and the Holocaust and USSR. And they went to Israel and then they came to New York. <laughs> um, and we were able to talk to my mom's second cousin on the phone and it was like, um, and on my dad's side, he's a whole mix of Western Europe. Um, and we were able to find a, one of his second cousins in Sweden alive and um, hanging out um, in her 80s. Um, and her daughter was in the database and she was a genealogist. And we had this idea after emailing with her for a while, we were like, what if we took a family trip and we like met your cousins? Would that be kind of cool? And we decided to do it. Um, and we went to Sweden. And we met like these people who are connected to us through like the 1800s, but you know, second cousin doesn't seem that far away, really. Um, and what was amazing was that we also then found a local historian. Sweden has incredible records and they're, they're very um, good at keeping track of things in general. And we were able to go back and see where my dad's grandmother, like where she worshiped and like the school where she, um, the school that she attended, um, the foundation of the farmhouse where she grew up before she emigrated. It was, it was amazing. Wow. Now you mentioned three different databases, which would uh, it, say, for instance, if I wanted to start the journey tomorrow, which database would be the best to be able to, I guess, find the most or the broadest information about my family? Yeah. So the, um, generally speaking, if you want to do genealogy work, the thing that's really going to help you is finding those cousins, right? And so you want to go with a bigger database um, oftentimes just because you're most likely to find more cousins there. Um, so the big two companies, um, there are four main companies. There's um, Ancestry 23 Me, My Heritage and Family Tree DNA. Um, Ancestry and 23 are, me are the biggest. Ancestry has 18 million people. 23andMe has 12 million people. It, that's an enormous number. Like within you know, a few years ago, nobody could dream of that many people. Um, Ancestry says if you test at this point, you're on average going to find 50,000 DNA cousins to you. 50,000. Wow. And you won't know who most of those people are, right? The top, at the very top will be somebody you know, probably. Maybe you have a, a sibling who tested or a cousin, first cousin. And then you go up page after page after page and you're like, I have no clue who these people are, right? They may, they may be related to you really far back. Um, wow. but yeah, I would say if you're, if you're, if you're looking for, to, if you're looking for cousins, you want to just go based on database size, probably. Uh, okay. Um, you had mentioned some, some of the passages that you thought could, could be, um, pretty interesting, um, in the beginning. Can yeah. you read one of those to us? Yeah, right sure. I can read, I can read a passage from the beginning of the book, um, it's, uh, it's from the prologue to the book. And I kind of talk about um, the different um, people who are drawn to DNA testing and sort of what they find out. Um, and again, audience, if you have any questions, um, go yeah, ahead okay. and type them in for us and we will try to get answers for you ASAP. So I think, you know, we're in this kind of unique moment right now in time where genealogy is very popular and you can find out more than ever through genealogy and through DNA testing. Like past genealogists would have been so jealous of what we can learn. Um, so I talk in the beginning of, about, of the book kind of setting up who is drawn to DNA testing um, and, and why. I came to think of the community of people I encountered researching this book as seekers. They are people obsessed with figuring out just what's in their genes. Not everyone who orders a direct-to-consumer DNA test qualifies as one, though a lot of folks who enter into this casually find themselves unexpectedly captivated by questions they never thought to ask, questions posed by the DNA itself. At-home DNA testing is sometimes called recreational. 
to distinguish it from genetic tests that are ordered by doctors. But its implications can be far more profound than the term recreational implies. The seekers generally fall into one of three categories. Some started out as avid genealogists. Before they ever ordered a DNA kit, they were already subscribers to the vast stores of genealogical records at Ancestry.com. Some had already flown out to the Mormon-run Family History Library in Salt Lake City, Utah, and spent a week there, camped, up, camped out up to their ears in old church records on microfilm. For these people, DNA testing through a company like Ancestry or 23andMe was a logical extension of this deep genealogical curiosity. These seekers try to chase, trace their family trees back hundreds of years using DNA combined with genealogy to suss out the identity of a particular 19th century ancestor or figure out exactly how they're related to a distant cousin. If elderly relatives have difficulty generating enough saliva to spit into a vial, these seekers know the answer is a slice of lemon. A few, thwarted by the unexpected timing of events, have even resorted to swabbing the insides of their parents' cheeks after death. The second category of seekers is marked by a more immediate and pressing puzzle, brought on, say, by lingering suspicions that the man they called dad might not be their genetic father, or they might be looking for evidence that they're not related to a family they never felt at home in. Some find their suspicions validated and others are disabused of them, and some find something else entirely, like a previously unknown half-sibling. Many seekers are adoptees looking for their biological relatives or people conceived by a sperm donor seeking the stranger who contributed half their genetic material. These people join Facebook groups dedicated to the mechanics of what's known as genetic genealogy, learning to talk of haplogroups and centimorgans and triangulation. They sketch countless family trees trying to figure out where they might fit into them. They call their hobby an addiction. They read tips on how to phrase letters of introduction to their fathers, a topic so fraught and fascinating for what it reveals about the vagaries of human nature and the complications of the human heart that it deserves a dissertation or three. The third category of people have no inkling that they're about to find anything surprising. And this is often the most disruptive way in which DNA testing plays out. These people do not start out as seekers. Instead, they test to find out if that old family story of a Native American ancestor is true. They test because they want to know whether they're like that guy in the Ancestry DNA commercial who thought he was one thing and turned out to be another. I traded in my later hosen for a kilt, he declares, happy in his certainty. They test because they got a kit as a gift for Christmas and then Easter dinner becomes awkward because the test has revealed something strange. Perhaps a family's understanding of its heritage is muddied by a pie chart offering one's ethnicity estimate. And the question, why is it saying I'm half Greek becomes a curiosity, which becomes a nagging doubt, which becomes a family conversation no one will ever forget. Then these people too become obsessives, trying to solve the mystery, finding possible relatives through Google and Facebook searches, and then offering to buy and ship DNA kits to those people if they'll agree to test. Well, some of them do. Some of them presumably back away slowly, like a hiker who spies an old grenade from a long ago war on a beach. These people don't tell their stories. Who could blame them? These people don't have stories. They have DNA results they'd rather not have seen and which they may prefer not to believe. And that's from the, the very beginning of the book. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, again, you're listening to Libby Copeland with The Lost Family. And uh, I believe we have a couple of questions. Um, Sam, can you help me out with those questions? Sure. We have a couple of questions in the chat box. The first one says, good evening. I teach local history and culture to local people in communities all over the country, but mostly here in Northwest Louisiana. The very first question or project I ask my students is to provide a summary of their own family and trace back as far as possible their history and country of origin. As you can imagine, the better off economically the student is, the more they know about their family history. The poor students unfortunately find this question project very challenging and difficult. Do you have any suggestions or best ways to go about this without doing more damage than good? Yeah, that's a really good question, wow. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, I guess I wonder, um, I guess I, I've, I've been wondering broadly about these family history projects that get assigned, um, and wondering whether, um, and I don't know if this speaks to Chris at all, but, um, it might speak to others, um, 
whether in fact the history research that we do might be located in a different way, right? So it might be looking at um, your community rather than your, your people for a few reasons. One is that, as you say, um, you know, certain people are, you know, going to have access to information and others are not, right? And of course, you're not going to probably suggest that your students do a DNA test. That would be very complicated and potentially ethically fraught. Um, so then they may kind of be hitting that brick wall and not getting as much out of that project. That would be my gut. But the other thing is, I had this experience recently with a, um, a friend of mine um, who comes from an atypical family. So we tend to assume that everyone comes from a nuclear family in the face of so much evidence that many, many people do not. And I think that when we assign sometimes these projects, I'm not talking really to Chris here because this is a, a higher level project that he's talking about, but younger children, you know, creating, uh, researching their family trees and creating crests. Um, what that often does is then not acknowledge the atypical families, which in fact are becoming increasingly typical, right? So stepfather, single mom, um, you know, maybe a step grandparent, those people are not easily represented on your typical family tree. And yet what the age of DNA testing is teaching us is that increasingly the standard shape of a family is not standard right? Increasingly, um, we have to make room for um, relationships that think outside the box of these kind of binary, um, the binary way of thinking, which is that, which is that family is either biology, or it's love, or it's both combined, but it's not, um, you know, it's, it's sort of one or the other. We tend to think, I think, in a, in a family and also ethnicity in these kind of binary terms, nature versus nurture, biology versus experience. And I think we need to be um, in general more expansive than that because, because so many families are just not constructed in that way, right? So many families, there's relationships with people you love, you're not genetically related to them um, and they're family nonetheless. So I don't know if that answers um, Chris's question, but I think it's a very provocative question. And I think it sounds like a fascinating assignment. Um, and what you're finding is um, interesting and you know obviously speaks speaks to what many people are finding when they try to do their genealogical work. Thank you. Our next question says, have you heard of Lolita Tatami, author of Cane River, one of Oprah's favorite books? Her genetic research on her own family history changed everything for her life and for many others around Natchitoches, Louisiana, which is where I live actually. <laughs> and surrounding areas. It's a fascinating story of why this information is so important to us individually in our understanding ourselves and also of our culture. Um, I hadn't, and I'm embarrassed that I hadn't, and I just wrote it down. So I- <laughs> Oh, like, you have to read it, it's great. <laughs> is, it, is it? Okay, I'm, I'm, totally, I'm totally going to read it. I'm very excited, thank you. And um, I may be a little biased because my family is from Cane River, so. I did not ask the question though. That's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. And you read and you read this book too? Uh, way back when it first came out. It was wow. all the rage. So and it was wow. the talk of the town. So wow, that's so cool. I love books like that. It is so amazing. There's something about genealogy work that makes history so alive. It it makes it come alive, right? I mean, because when you think about history in kind of a broad sense, it can seem kind of abstract, like who are those people? They were so weird. They dressed funny and they ate strange things. Um, and yet, if you can locate one of your um, grandparents or ancestors in a historical event, it makes that historical event become really real and relatable. And I think it makes us better connect people from the past because then they seem more like us rather than these kind of um, foreign, again, foreign people, you know, very different from us with funny hats. Um, and so I think genealogy is like kind of a, a compassion building exercise. It makes us learn from the past. And it makes us see our commonalities with, with our ancestors. Uh, Libby, what advice do would you give um, anyone who is thinking of taking a, a home DNA test? Um, just give us some advice with that. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I would say, you know, no going in that, you know, that you might really deepen your understanding of your family um, and um, that sometimes you might find something out um, that that is in conflict with what you thought you knew about your own self, about your genetic origins or about your family. 
there's no way to kind of know in advance what that information might be and how you might respond to it. Um, and so, you know, it's something to kind of think about, like, it might be something where you decide, all right, well, I'm going to really want to dig in. I'm going to put it off for a few months till I feel like emotionally ready. Right. Um, or it's something you do. And, and I have to say, you know, I mean, the, the people who've discovered something surprising about their genetic origins, even when it's been painful to a person have always told me they were glad to know, because it, it's important to know the truth about your own, where you came from and how you came into the world, even when, you know, even when it conflicts with what you understood and even when it means, um, some trauma sometimes, um, it, it also kind of just deepens your understanding of yourself, right? Um, and so, you know, it could be something you wind up being grateful for, but it's hard to say in the absence of that information. Um, the advice that I guess I really tend to give is more for the older generation, like the secret keepers, right? The people who are in possession of a genetic secret about their children, maybe. Um, you know, from a time when certain things were stigmatized that aren't anymore, like infertility, and perhaps they used a sperm donor and they never told that child, um, you know, and it's very hard to talk about, but um, it's time to consider, I think, whether there might be ways to talk to your child about that. Because from, from my reporting, you know, I found people are really much, much more receptive to and grateful for learning the truth when it comes from the mouth of someone who loves them, right? If, 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 if it's somebody who loves them and comes to them and says, I have to tell you something I never told you when you were born 60 years ago, it's easier to swallow um, than when you're discovering because you spit into a vial and you sent it off and you got um, surprising results on a computer screen. And that that means of finding out can really tend to fray that trusting relationship between a parent and child. So that's why I say um, it might be time to think about that difficult conversation. And if that seems like a really daunting thing and you don't know how you're gonna do it, um, there's starting to be resources for people. Um, there's a great website that I recommend called Watershed DNA. It's run by a genetic counselor in Virginia. And she kind of helps people, she holds their hands a little bit. Um, and she has a blog that you can read and she helps people like kind of navigate these, these tough, um, she kind of works as, I guess, a, as a bit of a mediator within families to help them. Um, so that, that's something to know about. And she's not the only one. There are psychologists starting to specialize in situations involving DNA surprises. So they're starting to be um, a kind of a network of professionals who are, are, who are um, arising to help people with the, this kind of these unprecedented situations. Wonderful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it, Miss Libby Copeland. It has been a <laughs> pleasure speaking with you this evening. Um, the book, The Lost Family, of course, it's, it's available at Shreve Memorial Library. And where else can they find it, Libby? Um, you can find it in the usual places. You can find it on Amazon. If you want to support an independent bookstore, which is a really great thing, you can find it on a, a website called bookshop.org, which supports independent bookstores. Um, there's also a bookstore near my house in New York. It's called The Village Bookstore. It's in Pleasantville, New York. Um, if you order from them, they can call me and I will come and I will personalize a copy, make it out to anyone. Um, if you want it to be a gift, you can send it to someone um, and they'll ship it anywhere in the country. So just another option if you're looking for a holiday gift. There you are, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the Free Memorial Library author chat happens right here each first Thursday of the month. Free Memorial Library author chat. We are so excited to have Miss uh, uh, Libby Copeland tonight. And thank you guys for joining us. And uh, until next time, um, you, you stay safe. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you all. Bye-bye.